uh, hand over to Alan Fascoot, so he needs very little introduction, a regular speaker in our Wednesday lecture series, practicing artist using the traditional uh, techniques of the old masters and a renowned art historian. And tonight he's going to talk to us about Pudge. Over to you, Alan. Thank you all for coming out this evening and thank all of you who uh, tuned in uh, on Zoom. Um, I, I've always wanted to give this lecture, okay, it's been years and Simon has given me the opportunity, so thank you Simon for giving me this opportunity. Let's, let's get right into it. The um, title of the talk is The Secret Techniques of the Florentine Masters, uh, the History of Pudge and the Renaissance, an art historical and artistic look at the development of baby fat in Florentine painting from 1200 to 1550. I guarantee this is a serious, absolutely serious talk. Um, okay, now, um, just so you know, the images of babies of my own children who have given their unconditional permission for use, okay, with a little bit of uh, persuasion. Now, <laughs> let's get into this. Babies and baby fat. We all know what this is about. This is my son, Joel, in about four or five months old. Um, who doesn't like baby fat? It's an anti-stress. Um, uh, we all know what it's like. We all had it, okay, and it's not COVID, but we've all had baby fat. Uh, and there, it's an important start of our lives. Um, and we have to sort of delve into this and see how it, what are the ramifications in, in Renaissance art? Now, if babies looked like this, let's pose this question, why did medieval painters portray babies like this? At, um, at left, you see my son, uh, Joel, when he was about four or five years old, but then you see the Madonna del Popolo, okay, in the Carmine, uh, and the baby looks a little bit different, okay? Or why did medieval painters paint the baby like this? This is Duccio, who has male part, uh, pattern baldness um, going on at a certain uh, point, okay? Almost looks like me uh, a few years ago. Or why did they paint babies like this? Now, I could have a string of sort of ugly baby paintings, but that's not the point of the talk. Uh, we have to get into something sort of a, a little more serious, okay? The way babies were actually portrayed. And we have to see what were the factors of the development of the representation of realistic baby fat. We all know what babies look like and everyone else knew what babies looked like. But then we have paintings like the one in the center by um, of the Madonna del Popolo, okay, with the small man. And then we have someone like Verrocchio in the 1460s and 70s who's doing these um, outrageously pudgy Michelin men-like sort of babies, okay? We have, to, we have to see what are the factors, okay, that made this change. And there's a problem with babies. And the, the objectives of this talk is to get right into this. The first objective is to explore the history of baby fat in Florentine Renaissance painting. Okay, and this is why I've always wanted to do this, okay, and sort of isolate this. The second uh, objective is to reveal the evolution of the theological image and the change of the artist's approach and techniques of study, okay, and representation of divine ripples of pudge. Because I think it's just more than just cute babies. Now, what's the sequence of the talk, just so you know where, where I'm going? I want to give a very quick introduction, section one, uh, to give a, a quick definition and the essence of baby fat or pudge, okay? Uh, the second section is a historical background of baby fat, a brief history of baby fat in Greek, Roman, and early Christian art. The third section is uh, Florentine medieval babies and baby fat and the artistic challenges that artists uh, uh, encountered and their solutions. And then when we get into Madonnas and the homunculus, okay, the baby Jesus, the fourth section, which is the which is the big section, is the rebirth of baby fat in the Florentine Renaissance. And I want to go through early Renaissance painters like Gentile Fabriano, Masaccio, Veneziano, and then the Renaissance, Lippi, Verrocchio, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Mannerist babies, but I'm only going to touch on Mannerist babies because that's a whole lecture in itself. And then finally, I want to get to the crux of the whole talk, capturing baby fat, the techniques of the Florentine masters. And then finally, we'll try and draw some conclusions okay, from, from all of this. Now, why, why have I always wanted to give this talk? Um, uh, just to, to tell you that I'm not sort of sort of weird, okay? I, I have, this is a personal study that I had when my children were young. I started to study them, okay, uh, when they were young and do drawings of them, of their faces, of their feet, okay, of the ripples of sort of pudge of baby fat. Um, and as I started to really delve into the intricacies of studying baby anatomy, okay, from when they were milking or when they were sleeping, I began to understand the difficulties of, of capturing uh, naturalistic baby fat and representing it in, in art. 
And that drove me directly to a correlation to Renaissance uh, paintings. So when you have uh, drawings of red chalk of a baby who's um, trying to get the, the large sort of a figure and who's moving around, I realized that the same problems that I had were probably the same problems that Renaissance artists had in the 1430s, 40s, and 50s, and, and so on. But then I've also done paintings of uh, the Madonna and children. And I know what, what it's like to put all this together. And I've done sculptures that write a whole series of Madonnas for the Vatican that trace the, uh, the Christ child from a nativity to uh, age three. And what I want to give are the insights of what it takes to create realistic baby fat or babies, okay, in order to really appreciate, okay, the work of the artist even more. So hence the secret techniques. Now, introduction. Babies and baby fat or pudge. Now, pudge is sort of a derogatory term. It comes from probably the late 1800s, based on being a chubby type of person. Um, uh, baby fat is, is uh, basically common to, to all babies. What is it? And let's just get a sort of scientific for just a second. Baby fat is actually called BAT, okay? Okay, brown adipose tissue, okay? Um, it's a tissue abundant in newborns, and there's a function for it. It's thermal regulation. In, us, in other words, it's supposed to produce heat to maintain the core body temperature. So it actually helps, okay, the growth of, of the young child. Okay, and this is actually my young son, Elia, when they're taking a bath, okay, when he's taking a bath. Now, this is when Elia was small, and if we go into the characteristics of babies, um, uh, infants and newborns from around zero to six months have eye movement, get, grasp objects, okay, they raise their head, they sit up, but there's not much baby fat yet, okay, they're sort of amassing it. It's only when you get to, okay, the toddler stage, okay, from six to 12 months, up to two years, and this is when they begin to laugh, to crawl, to play, their first words, their first steps, the growth of baby fat in this stage and this is when you start to get, and we all know them, the ripples on arms, on legs, when you start to find little coins in them after you, when you clean them up, and so it's actually quite, quite interesting. So the optimum ripples, let's say, between four to eight months, okay, of, of baby uh, anatomy. Now, if we see that in Renaissance art, well, if we go back to sort of see where it starts, where are their ancient precedents? So if we go from Cimabue at left, or uh, Domenico Veneziano in the center, and then Verrocchio, were they getting their sort of naturalistic baby fat from an, uh, ancient precedents? And let's just briefly go back into time and the background of baby fat in Greek art. And it does exist. We have to go to essentially vase paintings and maybe some sculptures. Now, baby fat in Greek art, it's really tied to, to one figure, Gaia, the earth, okay, this earth goddess. And this is actually from an Athenian red uh, figure, sort of calyx crater in, in Virginia. Um, she's the mother of all goddesses, okay? She's the nourishing, uh, nourishing, all producing a mother, nourisher of young children. And if you look at uh, sort of a, a general view of, of these children, they're small men, okay? It's not really naturalistic, okay? I can show you many examples, but we'll just sort of go on to, uh, to sculpture. If you look at the Salinas with the baby Bacchus in the fourth century BC, and this is actually quite good because it's in sculpture, you start to see this concept of babies, okay, uh, done correctly. And if there's a, the, if you show this close up, you can see that still there's sort of like a small man, okay, it's still sort of pretty well done, but it's a naturalism based on observation, obviously, but it wasn't the, the focus of, of, of all art. And I'll get into that in just a second. So the Greeks were actually, okay, competent at it, but it wasn't the, the sole function. If you go to Roman baby fat, okay, remember that the Romans sort of take everything from the Greeks, the baby fat is basically, how could you say it, concentrated on baby Hercules and obviously Romulus and Remus. And let's go into these two examples very, very quickly. Um, the painted images of Roman children, this is from a Pompeian fresco, and this is basically Hercules strangling the two snakes in front of Antotion and Alchemy. And this is from the House of the Vetae. And if you look at the sort of representation of, of small babies like Hercules, okay, he's this small man. The emphasis is on making him sort of like strong, okay, not sort of a weak little baby. He has to strangle these snakes in certain cases. So if you see it um, uh, in, in paintings, this is basically what, okay, the common sort of um, uh, image is. It's in sculpture again that you get, okay, the ripples of pudge. And this is actually baby Hercules again from around 200 AD in the Capitoline Museum. And this is where you get those ripples of pudge on the stomach. But, okay, those usually come very early on. He has a full head of hair. So they're sort of mixing and matching, trying to make him, making him look young, but he actually looks sort of a little bit sort of overweight in certain, in certain cases for a young child. The best example, however, uh, of Roman baby fat is on the Arapacus of 9 BC. And we have this image of Tellus which is basically a mother earth in the imperial age, 
nursing Romulus and Remus. And she is sort of like this pagan mother and child. And let's sort of look at this, okay, very, very carefully. We have this image of the mother, okay, um, with these two children. And if you look at these two individuals, these two small Romulus and Remus, again, they're very naturalistically done. They've got the ripples in the thighs, okay, at left or in the arms as well. So obviously they're going to nature. They're looking, they're representing it, okay. But if we try and uh, uh, sort of conclude, get a general conclusion on ancient baby fat, if we, if we could, okay, um, it's difficult to determine um, the approach to baby anatomy and also to baby fat basically become the, because there are few mythological themes other than Hercules, baby Hercules and Romulus and Remus, which required representations of babies and baby anatomy. They did it okay, because they had to. It wasn't the sole function okay, of, of their art. In fact, if you look at ancient art, it's the adult gods, Venus at left or Apollo, the emphasis was on the images of the adult God in their all their beauty. So the representation of babies and baby fat, yes, it was naturalistic, but it wasn't essential to the representation of pagan gods. It was the adult gods, not the children. And the, obviously there's the um, Aphrodite of Nidos at left and the Apollo Belvedere at right. But what happens to all this, all this naturalism? When we have to go to Constantine the Great, Okay, uh, 312 to about 30, 337 um, uh, AD. He's the first Christian emperor. And let's sort of step back to get a, a, like a, a quick history of all this. He recognizes Christianity in 313. And from that, making it the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire, the growth of this new Christian faith signals the end of pagan naturalism. In other words, nudity, okay? The new iconography that's allowed in this new Christian art is basically sort of the icon, the image, to show the majestas or the majesty. So the, all of the naturalism of Greeks and the Romans was lost to this propagandistic of, of image of power, okay, in this new iconic sort of art. Now, what this means, if you can pull it down, and I put these two images of Hercules. At the left, we have um, uh, this a copy of Lysippus's okay, Hercules, which was done for um, the uh, Baths of Caracalla. We all know that's the Museo Archaeologico in Rome. And then we have it, right, the Hercules by Giovanni Pisano, which is in the Pisa pulpit. Um, the nude figure, you have to understand, was the element of pagan religion, okay? Um, Christian art eradicated any image of bodily beauty, made it more severe. If you look at the images of Hercules, one is strong and muscular and the other one is sort of emaciated. The body is shown now without relishing in its nudity like the Greeks, or you can even say the Romans. And nudity is now the nakedness of Adam and Eve, original sin. There's a negative connotation. So the baby Jesus couldn't be shown nude. And if you can't be shown nude, you can't show baby fat. Now, when you get to Byzantine art, okay, from around roughly 500 on, you get the images of the Madonna and child, like this image from this one uh, gospel. And you can see this small little, okay, baby child, okay, the uh, baby Jesus, okay, in the arms of the mother. And we have to sort of delve in what were the artists allowed to show of the baby Jesus. Now, there's a paradigm change in artistic representation of divine gods. Um, instead of adult nudes, now it's a divine mother and young child, the Madonna and, and baby Jesus. Artists were called on to produce the Madonna and baby Jesus for altarpieces, okay? The major commissions of the time period. Baby Jesus, the baby becomes the principal element in sacred art. So there's a sort of a reverse sort of emphasis on, on the small little, little baby, but something happens, okay? Why were there so many, many babies in Florentine art? In Florentine art in specific, you can say all over the Byzantine era, but why are there images of, of babies in Cimabue from the late 1200s, from um, uh, uh, Domenico Veneziano in the 1440s and, and Verrocchio? And this comes into something that's extremely specific to Florence itself. The baby Jesus in Florence has a, a interesting sort of connotation because not only is it the Madonna with the image of a baby Jesus as the principal element of a Christian iconography, faith and belief, but it's the main theme in Florentine art. It becomes particular important after the pattern and Cathar heresies of the early 1100s. Now, this was a heresy um, that started up in Milan. It was actually groups that were trying to get back to the, the real religion. And they said essentially that all images of the Madonna, all images of the Christ child 
were not important. In fact, they were to be sort of eradicated. They were just sort of just didn't have any importance in, in this religion, in the soul religion. Now they rejected religious images. And as a response, mainly the Dominicans who are combating heresies and all these um, uh, in the 11 and 1200s, mainly the 1200s, I should say, their response were civic images of the Madonna. So we have altarpieces and also street tabernacles. In fact, Florence is one of the only cities, it's the only city in Europe with over 1,200 street tabernacles, usually dedicated to the Madonna and child. And you can see them. Who hasn't seen a tabernacle today? Okay, as they're walking down the street, that comes from this sort of response to this heretical concept that these images didn't have importance. So hence in Florence, there's an, an, an extra sort of emphasis on the Madonna and child, which means that when you get painters like the Maestro di Greve, the early 1200s in Uffizi, they have to show the Madonna and child, but they're showing them in the only way they can at that time, like little men. They sort of go back to that early Greek sort of concept. He can't be shown, the baby Jesus can't be shown nude because that would be pagan. You don't want to coincide Jesus, a nude baby Jesus, with pagan connotations of nudity like Romulus and Remus. So there's no naturalism. Okay, and no baby fat in certain cases. Now, this is a sort of goes hand in hand with the general concept of art at this time period, but specifically, the baby Jesus has to be shown like a little man. Now, why? Because the Byzantine theological approach to baby Jesus was king. Okay, Mary was the queen of heaven, and Jesus was the king. So the child had to have a regal nature, he had to be more king than child. So artists were forced to seek a solution to show how baby Jesus was a king, but still a child. So he's smaller, okay, but he has robes, sometimes an orb or a crown like this one in the, this Florentine painter, which is in the Academia, in which, okay, if you look at him, this is from 1250, in which he literally has a crown on his head and he's a little king. So it's interesting, he's smaller, he's the little king next to the big mother, okay, the queen, okay, of heaven. So artists had to choose, had to be very careful. And when you get to Madonnas like the um, Madonna del Popolo in 1268, it's the same concept. Now, it doesn't mean that there were artists who were trying to infuse it with a little more sort of baby aspect. But in essence, if you look at this child, he's a small man, okay? He's, okay, more regal, okay, more sort of um, serious than the regular, the regular child should be. Okay, so when you get to section three, okay, medieval babies and baby fat, and the artistic challenges and solution in Florentine art, this takes us to a next stage that grows from the Byzantine. Now, if you look at the basic medieval Madonnas, when you walk into that first room of the Uffizi, you see Cimabue at left, in the center, Duccio di Boninsegna, in the, in the center, as I said, and then at right, Giotto di Bondone, all done in roughly the same time period, 1280, okay, 1305, around 1310. They're all based in the same sort of, okay, position of mother and child. If you isolate the baby, okay, the baby Jesus, okay, you get what's considered, in fact, at this point in time, this little man or the homunculus, okay, the small man. All of them look more man than child. And what was the concept that the artist had to incorporate in these small in these small babies. The homuncle, this is actually Latin for a little man. And the theological concept, it was the medieval idea of Jesus perfectly formed and unchanged. He was God, but he was man, even though he was a baby. So they have to sort of wrestle with this visually, showing him like a baby, but a small man, but also God, okay? So baby fat would have been probably been antithetical to the seriousness the gravity of the importance of Jesus. You can't make him with small ripples, okay? Uh, it's just not regal. It's not sort of like this small man. So even though Giotto, okay, this image of Giotto is actually very naturalistic, he still has that natural sort of gravity or that seriousness in his face, okay? Even though he has a bit of a double chin or a little bit of ripples in his arms, okay, if you look in his, in his, um, uh, his wrist, okay? Now, the little man, what did, they, what did they choose? How did they approach this? like this uh, uh, detail from, from Duccio. It's actually, this is uh, pretty well done. Baby Jesus is usually dressed in a full robe, which sort of hid the baby anatomy. Usually had a full head of hair, which if you're looking at a toddler, they don't have full heads of hair with you know uh, locks. That's usually when you get into like the second year, okay, maybe two years old. In certain cases, they even show them even sometimes balding, okay, uh, 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 to sort of show, I'm not really sure why, maybe to show them sort of like a middle-aged man. 
but he's usually blessing or holding a scroll. Okay, he has very mature gestures and also mature demeanor. And obviously the minimal of baby fat or pudge or a double chin or small feet, they very carefully chosen, but he's all covered. You're not gonna see any of the, the true sort of babiness, okay, of a small child. So when you look at it from the artistic point of view, this is where it gets interesting. Um, there was probably a general lack of interest in naturalism. And this is common for okay, art in this time period. Um, uh, this is what the, the general norms of art, of art were. It was more iconic. Now, Giotto does take it a little bit farther. But in essence, artists were following the Byzantine conventions. Okay? Byzantine art is like that. They were very set okay, in, their, in their ways. There was limited artistic freedom. So artists probably were limited in showing any sort of naturalism because they knew that they had to stand, okay, basically keep everything in line, okay, with the status quo. But if you look at everything and try to make some conclusions on why medieval painters avoided baby fat, you could say that, yes, they were theologically bound to represent the principal ideals of the church, okay? They were concentrating on the iconography, the image more than naturalism. But they were also, and this adds the human element, because I can speak from experience, they were probably artistically challenged by the complexity and delicateness of baby anatomy and baby fat. So you could even say they willingly avoided baby fat, opted to show the king or little man. It was easier. And trust me, it is easier. Okay, They may have wanted to, but it's like, okay, let's get the painting finished and we'll get paid and, and everything is ever it and we're fine. Okay, now. This doesn't mean that there weren't artists who tried to put something more. And I love these paintings. And this is actually Ambrosio Lorenzetti. Remember, he dies in the plague of, um, uh, of 1348. This is his Madonna Lactans. It's in the Cathedral of Siena. And this is fascinating. I don't know if you can see this. Okay. He's got little ripples of pudge. These aren't tribal tattoos, okay, on okay. his arms and his forehead and his front. These are actually, he's trying to show something extremely naturalistic. Now, this poses some interesting questions. Was he capable? Yeah, okay. He's trying to do something very sort of admirable, but the time wasn't ready yet, okay? It wasn't. And if you look, okay, a comparison of uh, one of my studies of my son when he's milking, you can see that, okay, he's, he's giving it. He's even the position of the leg going up. Okay, as he's milking. In fact, this is where my own son was milking. So he's trying to be very naturalistic, but it doesn't turn the corner. It's not his time yet. In fact, it would never be. And it was gonna uh, so take about a hundred years more. Okay, so this was, there was naturalism. They did see it, but it just wasn't gonna happen in certain cases. Now let's get to section four. The rebirth of baby fat in the Florentine Renaissance. And this is, okay, sort of let's uh, uh, I'll take this on sort of head on. If you look at the, uh, painting of Gentile Fabriano, we all know this, okay, 1423 in Uffizi, and it's praised for not only the frame, but the, the narrative, okay, the lack of gold leaf, okay, the, the, um, the horror vacuum of all the details. But the one thing that's extremely interesting is that the Christ child is semi-nude, which is extremely interesting from this time period. Now, there did exist other images, but this is interesting because this is for a major family, okay, for a major church, in Florence. So he's actually doing something very sort of almost radical. And if you compare him to Giotto, okay, who was considered the one who sort of uh, 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 brought painting from the, the Greek into the Latin, well, he outdoes even Giotto for his naturalism because this painting, okay, this baby is actually completely, completely semi-nude. And there's a bit of, okay, pudge on him, okay, or a little bit of baby fat, okay. Now, we can go and look at 14, the 1420s, and go to Masaccio, the Madonna Materza, also in the Uffizi. And what's so interesting about this is that the Christ child is now completely nude, showing his uh, sort of uh, genitalia, okay? But he also has um, this sort of like, um, he's unabashedly nude, almost, okay, you could even say pagan. But what's interesting is that Masaccio is undoubtedly looking at, okay, real children. Now, this is, again, my son again. And there is a period in when, when babies are growing that their pudge starts to look like muscle and they start to look like really uh, sort of a, um, a well-built men. And this, I think, is the baby that Masaccio actually sort of caught, okay? But it was more naturalistic than we probably uh, realize. Now, when we go to uh, uh, Domenico Veneziano, okay, which and his uh, son, uh, St. Lucy altarpiece of the 1440s, also in the Uffizi, okay, this Christ child, 
It's completely nude, and I love this little detail. He's tugging on the virgin's um, sort of dressing. You know, okay, when's the when's the the the, the milk market going to open up? I'm I'm hungry. Okay, but if you look at this figure, and I and and I'm looking at this. This is actually a brilliant little child. Now the painting is brilliant. I think one of the most brilliant paintings in the, in the Renaissance, but if you look at the anatomy of the Christ child and the difficulty of all the different sort of um, uh, ripples of pudge and also the, and I, I'm starting to sound weird to myself actually, so I'm the ripples of pudge, okay? But all the, the correct in the arm and stuff like that. And these are some of the drawings I did of my son. This is extremely difficult. So that when the figure starts to move and the Christ child starts to move like this, you can see that he's even getting some of the natural movement of the anatomy of the Christ child. It's brilliant. It's actually correctly done. And this is in the 1440s, okay, um, uh, well before even, even Leonardo. So you can say it's a, it's a baby fat renaissance, okay, from Giotto to Gentile Fabriano to Masaccio to um, uh, uh, Domenico Veneziano, okay, it sort of slowly goes from dress to half dress to completely undressed, okay. But why the need to depict baby fat? And let's go to one uh, art historian. His name is um, uh, Matthew Everett, okay? And there's the Everett thesis. Now there's no documented reason why babies started to show up nude with pudge, okay, in paintings. And Matthew Everett wrote a book called The Early Modern Child in Art and, Renaissance, and, and History, I should say. And what's his thesis? He basically states that because the Renaissance Florentine middle class began to flourish in the 1440s and the early in the 1400s, um, they could now afford images of their own children. And they wanted cute babies, okay? They didn't want ugly babies, they wanted cute babies. So cute babies, in other words, with baby fat became the norm. And this in turn influenced the images of Jesus. They wanted to see the baby Jesus cute with baby fat as well. It was the concept of this kind of childhood, okay? In other words, they wanted to sort of capture childhood, which is actually, I, I would say it's a, it's a good thesis. But I think there's actually something, something a little more um, uh, poignant to this. Babies and baby fat in Renaissance are, I think the two possible reasons are plague and childbirth. If you look at the population of Florence during the plague of 1348, there was an after, I should say, there was a new importance of childbearing. And I think this influenced art. And the second reason is probably the reassurance of young girls in light of the dangers of childbirth. And let me elucidate on this. There was a need for images of healthy children, the proliferation, you could say, of baby fat in paintings and sculpture to help this along. It's sort of what we are, okay, right now in Italy with this sort of negative population right now. Where do I get this from? Let's go to the introduction of Boccaccio's Decameron, okay? When he tells about this onset of this new virus that's coming in from the East, it's very sort of uh, current. And this is what he says, uh, this is one portion of it, who, before this fatal calamity would have thought that there were so many within the city. Oh, how many grand palaces, how many beautiful homes, how many noble dwellings filled with families, with lords and ladies became completely emptied even of children. There were no more children after the plague, okay? They had died. And if you look at it, there's a civic importance of the family and babies. There was a catastrophic population decline caused by the plague. The numbers, more or less, 120,000 in 1338, that's the general population. And it goes down to 37,000 in the 1440s, right when these paintings are being done. Cities and families felt the need to increase in population, to survive, to fight wars, to pay taxes, okay? There's the civic nature of the city state, the emphasis on the, emphasis on the family and procreation and the importance of Okay, babies. Now, how do we turn this? How do we, we bring this down to it? It's a concept of childbirth. Now, if you look at childbirth in this time period, pregnancy and delivery were to follow marriage. Children, uh, uh, girls were getting married at 12 and 13, and they were essentially sort of expected to give birth to as many children as possible. But there was the anxiety of conception because they had to populate. That was one of their duties, so to speak. There was also a fear of childbirth. I've read where when a young girl became pregnant, one of the first things she did was she made out her last will and testament. That's because there was a high mortality rate of mother and child. So the mortality rate, you could say there was one in 10 of Florentine women died in childbirth, which is really high. Many babies died during childbirth, even before their first birthday. And I think one of the best representations of this 
is Verrocchio's release, uh, relief of the death of Francesca Pitti Tornaboni. Remember that uh, um, uh, Giovanni Tornaboni's wife, Francesca Pitti, died during childbirth. I wish I could read you that letter. It's, it's horrific. She goes through a tremendous sort of uh, delivery at left. She's totally um, sort, of, uh, 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 sort of knocked out. She dies and the baby is born, stillborn. And this is what they're, uh, right, they're presenting it to Giovanni. But people didn't want images of dead babies, even though that's what they saw all the time. They wanted images of this, images of healthy babies. And a healthy baby has baby fat. Now, what do I mean by this? There is a general theory, okay? And this comes from this, of, of this domestic and devotional concept of the, the Florentine family by this guy named Giovanni Dominici, okay? He wrote this treatise. It was actually a, a bunch of sermons that he gave between 400 and 1406, right here in Florence. And he's the advocate of art in the service of religion. And what does he say? He says, the first rule is to have paintings in the house of holy little boys or young virgins in which your child, when still in swaddling clothes, may see himself reflected with actions and signs attractive to infancy. And as I say of paintings, so I say of sculptures, the Virgin Mary is good with the child in her arms and the little bird or pomegranate in his fist. And what do we get is we get this proliferation of images, okay, of baby fat. Now, how can we conclude on this? There was probably a factor of plague, the death of children. Okay, Florence had to be populated. Realistic images were used perhaps to calm young girls who were made to give birth at an early age. In fact, in certain cases, they said that these Madonnas were right above okay, the bed in the, in the bedroom. They didn't want ugly little men or little kings or unrealistic babies with, that were balding. Okay, those aren't reassuring. They wanted cute babies. They wanted babies with baby fat that were positive and also calming. Who doesn't Okay, want to see this. Even if you go to a hospital, what do they have? They have posters of mother and child when the baby is actually healthy. Even the same thing that happens even, even today. So there was a need for baby fat, if I'm sort of the prophet of baby fat now. Okay, Madonna with um, a, a healthy baby is, yes, a religious icon, but it was also needed psychological support. Artists had to make babies real, okay, to tie into the need. Okay, in other words, the need for this reassuring baby fat. And who's the best of it? Okay, at this time period, Luca della Robbia. I wish I could give a complete talk on this. He's the real first true master of baby fat. These are brilliant. Okay, they're brilliant. They're gorgeous. Okay, and remember, these are in terracotta, glazed terracotta, so people could afford them. There's more Luca della Robbia um, uh, works uh, in Florence than any other artist. Okay, people can check me on that. But he does this constant image of mother and child, mother and child, and these babies are quite well done. They're healthy baby, plump babies. So let's get into the, the final development of Renaissance baby fat, late 1400s to early 1500s, because it changes from there. Yes, there's an increased naturalism and an emphasis on the roles of pudge, but baby fat is no longer purely theological, or I would even say psychological in certain cases. Now it becomes artistic. Artists no longer avoid baby fat, they begin to study babies for paintings and sculpture. In fact, it becomes an artistic challenge. Baby fat for baby fat's sake, if I can coin that phrase from art for art's sake. And this demonstrates a virtuoso artistic skill. And you can start to see it in the paintings and the sculptures. Now, what do I mean by this? Filippo Lippi with his Madonna in the Uffizi, which is one of the most favorite paintings ever. This little child is probably his own son, Filippino Lippi, okay? And he has this perfect, I like to say, he's this little sort of a Winston Churchill little baby uh, of, uh, of Renaissance art. He's perfectly formed. That's probably because he's re uh, referring to his own son as he is to his probably his, his, um, his main squeeze. Okay, look at that, or Andrea Verrocchio, okay, with this plump little baby, okay, in the lower left, which has more ripples, okay, um, than are probably natu naturally possible, okay, and it becomes his artistic, okay, sort of challenge. Or Leonardo da Vinci, okay, this Benoit Madonna, okay, in which you get this plump little baby with all the ripples in his arms and his legs, and I don't have to point them out because they're, they're right there. And Leonardo is the only artist in which I found a direct reference to baby fat in their writings. He isn't to say baby fat, but this is what he says in his notebooks. Little children must be represented with lively wriggling <laughs> actions when they are seated, okay? And that's exactly what he puts into his paintings, these wriggling sort of ripples, okay, of, uh, of flesh. But then you get to Michelangelo and here it already starts to change. 
the Christ child, if you look at him in the Doni Tondo, is on, I, I have to say, it's steroids. Okay, he's got, okay, extreme muscular development. And this is when you start to see that the babies now become, okay, this artistic sort of virtuoso expressive um, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, element in paintings. In fact, if you look at Michelangelo's works, like the tondi that he does, the today and piti tondi, these children now are moving. They're not seated, they're, they're um, excuse me, they're um, jumping, okay, they're straddling, okay, they're actually doing something a little more sort of athletic, okay, than just seated, okay, babies, as we're seeing uh, before. And then you have one of this, one of the major drawings of Michelangelo, probably for the, the Florentine Madonna and the, and the Medici tombs, okay, where this baby has more muscles than baby fat, okay, but it works. This is Michelangelo sort of infusing his muscularity, even on the baby fat of a small child that's actually sort of uh, milking as well. Now, I'm only going to touch on this because this is a whole universe of mannerist baby fat. The um, Parmigianino, the Madonna with the long neck of four, uh, 1540, we could do a whole lecture just on this. This baby is just milked, okay, and he's sort of like, and babies do this when they stop milking, they throw their arms out and they basically say, okay, I'm done. But this turns it into this mannerist baby. His head looks even looks detached and we can go into mannerist babies in another talk, but you have to understand that babies then become even more expressive, more expressionistic, okay, in this time period. And I, I can't go any more than that because we don't have enough time. But how did the artists actually do this? How do you capture baby fat? And this is what I want to get into, the techniques of the Florentine masters. How do you do this? And let's do a case study, okay? Ghirlandaio, the Nativity in Santa Trinita, okay, right across the river, okay? This amazing Tempera Grassa painting um, done for uh, Francesco Sassetti. There is a little baby, okay, the Christ child, right by this sarcophagus. And he has all the right sort of pudge, okay? He's got, okay, the pudge is on his uh, thighs, okay, in his on his belly, okay, on his wrist. How do you do something like this? How did he do something like this? Um, and let's sort of get into that. What's the artistic challenge? The artistic challenge is creating a correct full figure image of baby anatomy. The challenge also it resolve, um, have to you have to resolve the natural position of the limbs. They hold themselves differently than adults do. You also have to show the delicate nature of child anatomy, the correct placement of baby fat, the realistic ripples, and then even more difficult, the delicate features of the head, the face, and also the chubby cheeks, for example. Now that's a lot, okay? From the feet, head to toes, you have to nail it. Otherwise, the baby just doesn't look correct. Now, what are the major difficulties of representing baby fat? You have to find the baby with the right age, okay? Newborns, uh, no, okay, a little older, yes, okay? You also need a person holding the baby. You can't invite a baby into your studio and say, please hold that position for you. It's not going to happen, okay? Also, the anatomy has to be studied separately and then has to be reassembled in certain cases to form a full figure. That's one technique. And then the other is toddlers don't stand still. Okay, who hasn't tried to look after a toddler? Did you ever stand still as one minute? You don't. And then the other thing is full figure drawings are possible, but they're extremely difficult. And let's sort of pull this apart. Um, first off, you have to find the baby with the right age. So you have to imagine that a Renaissance artist, a painter who has to do a Madonna, the first thing he has to look for, if he doesn't have his own children, he has to find a woman. And there are lots of them, okay? I mean, the people were, were giving birth and people were giving multiple births. You can't do a newborn uh, like uh, Elia at left, okay? Though you want to get a baby that's a little, a little older, okay? That has survived in a certain in a certain sense. So you have to go around and look, okay, with friends or, or some. I luckily had okay my own to deal with, okay. But then you also need someone to hold it, and it's usually the mother. And I refer to this uh, a drawing by Raphael. Now these are sketches because he has to get these down, where you have the mother holding her child. Okay, and he's doing lots of different sketches. Okay, there's the mother's head. Okay, and these aren't idea sketches. These are sort of getting that split second, and it's happened to me where the mother holds the child, and it's extremely poignant and eloquent, and it's very difficult. Okay, to uh, capture. In fact, I found that when my wife was actually milking my son, now he's a, he was a newborn here. It was a little bit too scrawny to to use, but you find these very sort of eloquent positions, and you have to capture them. They 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 come and they go in a split second. So you need someone holding the child in order to get that motherly quality. 
And then you have to get the correct ripples of pudge. This is a drawing by Leonardo in which he probably had someone hold this young child in which, okay, um, uh, also you get all these uh, sort of ripples in the neck, okay, and in the, okay, the back as well, okay, front, okay, and back in order to get it correctly, okay. And then you get the separate studies technique, okay. And this is also another sheet by Leonardo. In fact, he's sort of the father of this experience in which you get, okay, the sides of the baby, okay, you get other baby sort of images right here, but then you have the leg isolated, okay, around the knee, all these other ripples, even the hands, and he's studying them separately. And I found that when I came into this, okay, this sort of realm, I realized that yes, okay, I think someone just made the comment that babies do sleep, and that's exactly correct, okay. Um, they do sleep, but you still have to study these things, okay, separately in order to get them correctly, especially the shading, because remember, it's a round form. And if you're intent on naturalism, that's exactly what you have to concentrate on as well. So I found that when I was doing my studies and I started to look at these other studies by Leonardo, I realized that he had the same problems, okay, as I did, okay. And then you try and get the full forms, and that's usually when they're seated. And there is a portion, there is a time period when the babies are perfectly balanced with all their pudge. They sort of plop them down and they don't go anywhere. They're perfect. When they get out of balance, they usually fall. And you can see that, okay, he probably got a baby from that same time period when I was drawing for my son, the son Joel. Now, these separate studies then have to be reassembled and they have to be reassembled correctly. Okay. And this is where the artistic sort of vision comes in. This is where the art comes in. And this is where the knowledge of this anatomy comes in in order to create a baby, as he said, that with wriggling motions makes it look, okay, natural, okay, which is not as easy as, as it seems. And then you have Michelangelo, there's this wonderful sheet, okay, sort of to show toddlers don't stand still, okay, when you have all these images of babies, okay, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay, in which he's trying to follow them around, and this is what I was doing with my children, you're literally sort of crawling on the ground with them as you're studying them, okay, hoping, them that, hoping that they will stand still, okay, and I found that when I was trying to do full figure, okay, images of my sons, okay, that you get the same sort of, okay, okay, stay there, stand still, can you hold them please? And the mothers always get really angry because my, my wife did and that usually happens, but that's what happens and that's what this sheet shows that he's taking the time okay, to study, to find the child and to do these studies, okay, as well. And then baby faces, the chubby cheeks, okay, like this study at left by Leonardo, okay, which is absolutely brilliant with his hair, okay? And this is a study of my son, Joel, which I was too intent on getting the chubby cheeks that I didn't even get the top of the head in, okay, on the rest of the sheet of paper. Now, how do you do something like this? Okay, and there's a couple of techniques. There's the portrait while sleeping technique, okay, which I think, again, someone just managed. Now, this is difficult because you've got to get the child, okay, when they're propped up, this is my uh, son, Joel, okay, I'm not sure if Leonardo did this, but he maybe just added in the eyes afterwards, or you can keep them sort of entertained, but they don't stand still. And that's why I think this head, which is so well drawn, if they're sleeping, you can get the cheeks, okay, and the, and the mouth, okay, perfectly, perfectly drawn as well. And then the full figure, you have to be quick. Now, this is a study by Barocchio. Full figure studies are possible. They have to be smaller. And this is where you can see that, okay, this you have to have a knowledge of the figure, okay, of the anatomy in order to capture the movement of the figure. You can see all the different studies on this, okay, sheet, full figures, very difficult to do. This shows the artist sort of, okay, how could you say it, skill in capturing, okay, the baby anatomy. And you go to Raphael. Now, I didn't include Raphael paintings because that would be Madonna after Madonna. I'm a little bit pre-Raphaelite like this in that manner, okay? But if you look at these studies, he undoubtedly, okay, either had the baby standing uh, um, seated on a mother or in certain cases sort of did the complete figure with very quick drawing skills. In fact, he was a master draftsman, okay, to get the complete figure all together. And just as a comparison, okay, to do a complete figure, okay, like this, okay, takes... Uh, uh, you have to be very quick, you have to be very almost instinctive, okay, in other words, uh, get the anatomy down, you see it, and you draw it, and after drawing these, okay, it usually you're, you're exhausted, because you're concentrating at a second's notice in order to get this, okay, uh, uh, correct. Now, the Girlandau baby, let's get back to him, how do I think he did this baby, okay, I think he did it exactly the way I did my son, Elia, okay, he was probably sleeping, okay, a sleeping baby, 
Okay, complete baby. That's why I think the Caravaggio painting in the, in the Pitti, he wasn't dead, he was just sleeping, but that's just my own um, sort of a, a, a observation. So if you look at this figure, okay, the way he's actually, okay, positioned, he was probably a sleeping baby that he drew the entire one. And Gierland I was a master draftsman, okay, um, uh, as well. Now, what's the work involved to create an image of baby fat or babies? Okay, so if you look at the Leonardo Madonna, okay, with this wonderful uh, uh, Madonna, you realize that you have to have studies of the head. You have to have separate figures, uh, separate figure studies. You have to have complete figure studies in order to put it all together. The babies represent a massive amount of work in order to make these Madonnas. And you can imagine why in the Byzantine and early medieval okay, times, they didn't wanna do that, okay? And let's come to the conclusions. So sort of uh, bring this together. When we look at the babies, when we look at all these um, images of babies, we, we can see that it, come, it goes from a king, okay, at left to a real baby to expressive means, uh, if you go through the sort of the history of it. Um, why is Renaissance baby fat important? Okay, why, am I, why am I talking uh, about this? Because I think the general conclusion is that the images of baby and baby fat unite a theological, a social, and even uh, an artistic change in Renaissance society. It's a religious icon. It can be a positive maternal image. And it's also a representation of Renaissance naturalism in itself. And let's go a, a little farther. The artistic is that baby fat or pudge was once avoided, okay, but now in the Renaissance, it's fully embraced. It's an artistic challenge. In fact, it's more challenging even than sort of adult anatomy. And to uh, be able to correctly represent baby fat, okay, is an indication of an artist's adherence to nature like Leonardo and also his virtuoso skill like in the Mannerist period. And finally, if you look at it generally sort of stepping back, the Renaissance ideal of children and childhood really shows that for them, it was now worth studying. So Everett was basically correct, um, recording it, but they tried to use it as an element of beauty, okay, along with, okay, the Madonna and the general image of the, of the painting or sculpture. Renaissance baby fat represents, you could say, an acute sense of the importance of motherhood and the well-being of children, which if you look at the history of art, this is unique to the Renaissance, extremely unique. You can think of Marie Cassatt in the Impressionist uh, uh, period, but in the Renaissance, this is central. And then finally, I think that baby fat, the images of babies, even though they might be overlooked, communicate uh, what I say is a, a universal, even cross-cultural innate fascination with the delicacy and also the tenderness of small children and also with one owns humanity. Thank you very much for, okay. Um, uh, uh, staying with me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll just get some lights on. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Um, and as always, um, it's now time for the question and answer. So if you're in the room, just put your hand up and I'll bring you the microphone. Um, and if you're on the Zoom, uh, you can, let, let's just take this um, oh, yeah. top one, stop share. Uh, yeah, now, now we can see you all on, on the screen. <laughs> if you're on the Zoom, all you have to do is uh, show your face, unmute and say something, or you can put a question or comment into the chat and I'll read it out on your behalf. So do we have anyone who wants to start? In the, in the room we've got somebody else. Thank you. One of my favorite paintings of all time is Guggenheim Masterpiece. Oh, okay. And there's a change of thought there. It's <laughs> unique to, to uh, fiction art, but I can't remember the kind of baby boy. And you know what? I, I avoided Northern art just because I think uh, Duncan Geddes gave a brilliant uh, uh, speech um, last year on, on that. It was absolutely brilliant about um, uh, in Northern art, the baby is seen almost almost in rigor mortis and it's sort of the prefiguration of uh, of death. But I, I sort of avoid that probably the, the, the segue to, to this one in Northern art. Um, there are babies in Northern art, like the Hugo van der Hoos in, in the Uffizi, which is lying on the on the ground, would be, you know, very painful. Um, but Northern babies, yeah, that's a whole other, a whole other ball game. Yeah, but no, it's a, I, I knew someone would bring that up. Sometimes, but it's a, thank you, appreciate it. 
Okay. Um, there's a, up on the the, uh, the chat, we've got why the crocodiles at the time of the massacre of the innocents. It's easier to scalp, uh, scalp the baby than to paint one question mark. And specifically, why the baby needed to be an emphasis on genitals? Okay. Wow, that's uh, again, these are all interesting, interesting topics. Okay, the massacre of the innocents. Yeah, I think again, this it's part of the story of um, uh, uh, of, of Christ. Okay, and there's even medieval hymns and stuff like that dedicated to it. Also, is um, gives an uh, artist an opportunity to show really gruesome sort of things, and I think that's sort of um, a part of it. Uh, I think the one that comes to mind is Ghirlandaios in the in the, the the high altar of Santa Maria Novella. Okay, um, as well. I don't know if there was a, like a gruesome interest in it. about the genitals. I'll, I'll leave other people to, to talk about that, but I think there's also the humanity of it. I think Duncan Geddes, I referred to that uh, talk that he gave, um, how it shows up in paintings in which they're trying to figure out if he's okay, if he's male, the, the three wise men that come in, he made that brilliant point that the, the, um, the old king is actually looking at examining the Christ child to see if he is male. Um, I was, well, remember there was, that, there was that little issue of that Pope that was probably female um, uh, <laughs> and the, and the uh, uh, um, the, the, the tests that they had to give the popes okay, at a certain point to make sure that they were male. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of interesting things. Again, these are, um, I, I don't want to read into, into it any more than, than what it is, but I think it could just be to, to show their humanity as well, okay, which I think is a um, very good. Um, do we have, yes, we've got one more in the room. Hi. And I think this might be first to Duncan's lesson okay. as well. Okay. So they spent time working out how to paint touch. Why did they not work out how to paint baby faces? So that a lot of them look like middle aged men. Exactly. Baby faces, and, and I, I say from experience because I've painted them and I, I've drawn them and I've sculpted them. It's one of the most difficult things because if you look at baby uh, the, the baby features, okay. Now, if you look at a male uh, male female adult, you can see the understructure of the uh, of the cheeks of the temples. Okay, you have the skin, you have the, the various features that are very developed. With babies, um, what it's it's like bloated. You can't see any of the understructure of the skull. In fact, the only thing you can really see is the the shape of the head because they have no hair. That sort of delicateness is extremely difficult to do. Um, uh, and that's why I think in the beginning, the paintings that I showed you is they just didn't get because the baby's head, remember baby anatomy and, and Duncan actually shows this is one fourth of the entire proportion of the figure. So the figure is actually four, um, um, four heads high. The body is three heads high. Okay. The, 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 the skull is actually has more of the cranium than the actual face. So it, it goes against every major proportional system that we know of when you're actually drawing um, uh, a figure. Um, the nose, okay, is usually uh, sort of pointed up. The, the lips are extremely delicate uh, and even sculpting and painting them, I you know, did it constantly. So I think it's just the delicateness, the razor sharp accuracy you have to, to, um, you have to be razor sharp accurate in order to do it correctly. So I think it's just, just the, the difficulty of it, the pain difficulty. Uh, before we take an, another question, I just want to remind everybody that um, We've got a relatively small audience in the room tonight and a much larger audience on the Zoom. I imagine this is because we're in the middle of Omicron still. Um, but uh, be brave and come back next week. We will fully masked here and lots of safety pro protocols. Those who come to the room all pay registration fee. Uh, access on the Zoom is free, but we do encourage you to make a, a donation of whatever size you feel comfortable with to keep, help to keep us um, the, the Wednesday lecture series going and so we'll put the link up to help you do that. Um, so another question or comment from anybody, is anything else coming through here? Um, anyone want to speak to us from the Zoom? Just unmute and say something, we'll hear you in the room. No? Oh, we got one here. Well, it's it's slightly easier to to sculpt um just because you can um and i've done it in in in, in various materials just because you can maintain the um the the volume of it okay uh, you can feel it better with your 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 hands but in order to sculpt it you either have to draw it 
or, or you have to have a, a live child in, in front of you. And I've done both. In fact, the, the, the Vatican series I did actually, um, I used my young daughter as that with, for the face for, for the right young Christ child. And it was constantly, you're constantly sort of feeling her face to, to, because it's so delicate, so delicate. In, in certain cases, even when you have the child in front of you, you, you have to feel it. You've got to feel it in order to reproduce it. And, and it never really comes out the way you really, you really want it to, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> okay, any, any more in the room? Or anybody out there on the Zoom who wants to say something? Um, or put something in the comment. We've got something else in the comment. Patricia can't wait to get back to Florence and look at the paintings again. <laughs> Quite right, too. We can't wait to have you back here. Um, and for all of you who are around the world and looking forward to coming back, um, spring is not far away now. And start making your plans because I think once we, once we get to the end of March, things will start to normalize fast in, in Florence. So we look forward to seeing you. Um, okay, so I think we look like we're getting towards the natural end of the evening. So it remains for me to thank Alan very much for another fascinating uh, insightful talk from his unique perspective as a historian and a present artist. Um, thank you all for uh, the brave ones for coming into the room and the rest of you for joining us remotely online um, from all over the world. I see someone from Malmo there, which is really nice. Um, and uh, so, um, and we'll see you all, um, well, some of you tomorrow night for the concert, which is going to be fabulous. Um, and uh, the rest of you next week for. Um, Mark Roberts on uh, Charles Dickens in Florence, a slight change of focus. So thanks everybody and good night and be safe. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on. Let's go. <laughs>